Okay, so I, I believe I'm live. If I'm not, uh, yeah, we'll catch up later. So good afternoon, everyone, assuming that you can see me. I'm Dr. Mark Bennett, the Research Manager at the Royal Armouries, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the third talk in our winter lecture series. The Royal Armouries is the UK's national collection of arms and armour, although sadly no longer the UK's national menagerie. For 600 years, a visit to the Tower of London would allow you to see both our collection and a range of exotic animals, including at various stages, lions, tigers, elephants and polar bears, until the 1830s when a degree of rationalisation took place and the animals were sold off to America. Nevertheless, we continue to preserve a wide variety of arms, armour and artillery, from predominantly the Middle Ages to the modern day. However, our mission is not just to preserve these objects, but to bring the public closer to them. Our annual winter lecture series, which looks at a wide range of topics related to arms and armour, is one of the means by which we do this. These events run until April, and they cover topics ranging from things you might expect, such as military archery and medieval kite shields, to topics you might not, such as the forensics of firearm science and 19th century electoral violence. These were originally designed as physical events, and while they've translated well to the online space, the interaction between the audience and the speaker is still an important component of the talk. However, we are now making them available to watch after the event for a limited period of time. We'll send out a link to YouTube after the event and you'll be able to replay the talk until next Monday. If in future you're unable to attend but would like to uh, watch, simply sign up as normal and wait for the YouTube link to come through. As always, there'll be a question and answer session after the talk. If you're watching on YouTube, please uh, put any questions that you might have in the chat bar to the right hand side of your screen. If you're watching via Zoom, you'll find the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen where you can type questions. And as always, while I can't guarantee to get through them all, we'll cover as many as we can. So with the necessary preparation out of the way, I'd like, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Dan Spencer. Now, Dan was originally scheduled to deliver this talk in the fantastic series of lectures held down at Fort Nelson, our artillery, well, where, the, where we hold the bulk of our artillery collection, I should say. However, when the opportunity arose to have him speak today, I jumped at the chance and I'm very, you know, I'm very grateful that he agreed to, to deliver this talk twice to a slightly different audiences. And today's work draws on his, do his doctoral thesis and his new book, uh, which looks at the introduction of gunpowder weapons in England. So without any further ado, let me hand you over to our speaker, Dan Spencer. Hello, uh, thank you for the introduction um, and welcome everyone. Uh, this talk has uh, two main parts. Uh, I'm gonna begin by giving you a chronological overview of the development of gunpowder weapons and artillery fortifications in England throughout the 14th and 15th centuries using a range of historical sources, manuscript illuminations, architectural remains and surviving pieces kept in museums. I will then go on to focus a bit more on the guns themselves by discussing how they, construct, how they were constructed and operated, etc. before finishing by briefly mentioning the main factors that I feel were responsible for these developments. The earliest evidence that we have for gun powder weapons in England comes from illuminations from two manuscripts, which were presented by Walter D. Marmite to Edward III, on his accession to the throne in 1327. Uh, these guns have a peculiar appearance, which resemble vases or cauldrons, uh, and they're depicted as lying on wooden trestles, which are firing arrows. So not at all really what we would associate with firearms. Yet we can authenticate these illustrations through documentary records and a gun which was discovered off the coast of Sweden and which is in the museum in Stockholm. As you can imagine from the way they look, to begin with, these were essentially novelty weapons and it took time for them to significantly, significantly influence the conduct of warfare. We can trace the early history of gunpowder weapons uh, in detail due to the survival of the accounts of the Privy Wardrobe, a department responsible for the production and storage of royal arms and armour at the Tower of London which survived from 1325 to 1405. Guns are first recorded as being, having been used at the Battle of Cressy by the Florentine chronicler Giovanni Bellini 
But the earliest evidence that we have from English records is from later that year, when 10 guns supplied with lead bullets were transported for the siege of Calais. Yet it was not until the 1370s, in the reign of Richard II, that guns began to be procured and deployed in sizable numbers. In this period, they were primarily used for the defense of castles and towns. For example, Ashton's Tower on the left uh, was constructed at Porchester Castle by its constable, Sir Robert Ashton, between 1377 and 1381. This, as you can see, was built in the inner ward of the castle, with a number of keyhole insertions carved into the walls for the deployment of guns. Weaponry was supplied from the privy wardrobe, which in 1379 delivered three guns. An inventory of the equipment kept in the castle in 1385 records that it had four guns, two of which were made of iron and fired lead shot, whereas the other two were made of bronze and fired gunstones. Of the latter, one weighed 57 pounds and the other 68 pounds. Guns were also supplied to other castles, such as Dover, Corf, Roxburgh, and Berwick-upon-Tweed. Moving to the 15th century, the accession of Henry IV in 1399 led to a great change in the use of gunpowder weapons, with the new king employing the latest technology from the continent with expertise supplied by Dutch and German gunners. And in this period, we see the adoption of two new important types of guns, the bombard, often referred to as uh, being large guns in this period, and the fowler. Up until this point, guns were generally small and designed for targeting people as opposed to buildings. Yet by contrast, bombards were massive weapons that weighed thousands of pounds and were capable of firing very large gunstones, which could knock down the walls of fortifications. A number of surviving guns of this type are kept in museums, uh, with the Royal Armies having a fine example at its Fort Nelson site called the Boxstead Bombard. The power of these new guns was demonstrated by Henry V in his first French expedition. 1415 is most famous for the Battle of Agincourt, but in fact the most tangible gain, gain of the campaign was the capture of the town of Harfleur in Normandy. This was a hard-fought siege that lasted six weeks and was costly to the English in terms of manpower and equipment. And we are fortunate to have a detailed eyewitness account of the siege by the anonymous author of the Gesta Henrici Quinti, who I'm now going to quote from. He stayed awake night and day until, having prepared and positioned his engines and guns close to the walls in range of the enemy, he had them aimed at the face of the town and against its walls, gates and towers, and it set up in front of this artillery to withstand the shots and attacks of the enemy, defences and protective screens. These latter, consisting of long and thin planks, were so constructed and fitted with appliances of wood and iron that when the top was pulled down, the bottom was lifted up so as to give a view of the town until, a target having been selected, the guns from beneath behind them discharged their stones by the explosive force of ignited gunpowder. And meanwhile, from every side, our king, with his guns and engines, so he pounded the barbican and the walls and towers at all events, those from which the opposing enemy aimed their guns and catapults at us, that within a few days, when by the violence and fury of the stones, the barbican was in the process of being largely demolished, the walls and towers from which the enemy had discharged his offences were rendered defenceless, with their ramparts destroyed, and really fine buildings, almost as far as the middle of the town, were either totally demolished or threatened with inevitable collapse, or, at least, their framework falling apart has suffered extensive damage. What is really great about this the siege is that we have documentary evidence to corroborate the testimony of this narrative account, which is comparatively rare. This can be seen from a document enrolled in the King's Remembrance of Roll of 1417 to 18, which lists equipment that Nicholas Murbury, master of the king's ordnance, accounted for after the siege. The items include a total of 7,476 gunstones, which were fired by the attackers, 876 by the bombards, 
3,600 by the large fowlers and 3,000 by the small fowlers. Working on the assumption that the bombardment started on the 23rd of August and continued until the 18th September, the town was a target of on average 287 gun stones a day, consisting of 33 from the bombards, 138 from the large fowlers and 115 from the small fowlers. This volume at gunfire at such an early date is really quite remarkable. Similarly, manuscript illuminations support the claims of the Gesta regarding the use of mantlets to provide protection for gun crews, as we can see in these images. One of the most interesting things about the largest guns was that they were often given their own individual names. Typically, they were named after individuals, places or saints. For example, the accounts that Gerald Sprunge submitted in 1413 gives the names of multiple large guns. In the Tower of London, there were two guns called Cliff and Fowler. At Tower Wharf, two more called Bristol and George, with a further gun called God's Grace at Reading. This period also saw the introduction of artillery towers in England. The earliest known example of this type of fortification is the Cow Tower in Norwich, constructed at the very end of the 14th century, which consisted of a three-storey structure outside the circuit of the town walls, with the upper two levels containing two tiers of gun ports in a circuit around the tower. Another artillery tower from the period is God's House Tower in Southampton, built early in the 15th century on the southeastern corner of the town, which was used to store a sizable proportion of the town's artillery. The most important development of this period was the adoption of a new type of gun called the serpentine. This was a type of gun that was long in relation to its bore and mostly fired lead shot. The long barrel of this weapon meant that it had greater range and accuracy than other types of guns, which made it more effective in targeting enemy personnel than fowlers, particularly when mounted on carts. The versatility of serpentines meant they could be used both offensively and defensively in siege warfare, as well as on ships and on the battlefield. Guns were also now increasingly mobile and were often mounted on their own individual carriages, which meant they could be used more effectively on the battlefield. This can be seen from chronicle accounts of the battles at the Wars of the Roses, for example, the author of the history of the arrival of Henry IV states that the preparations made by Edward in 1471, prior to the Battle of Tewkesbury, included all things that were thought behoveful for a new field, so pervade artillery and ordnance, guns and others for the field great plenty. At the battle itself, the Yorkist ordnance was said to have been conveniently laid before them, which saw oppressed the Lancastrian enemies who had fewer guns, and provoke them into launching a disastrous attack. The loss of Normandy and the prospect of a French invasion at the end of the Hundred Years' War meant that many coastal towns in southern England invested heavily in improving their defences from the 1450s onwards. This can be seen from surviving town accounts, which reveals that some of these settlements were heavily equipped with ordnance. For example, an inventory for Southampton in Hampshire in 1467 to 8 lists 36 guns, including a bombard called Thomas with the Beard, whereas another one for Sandwich in Kent in 1482 to 3 shows that the town had as many as 53 guns and three handguns. They were supported in this endeavour by money and expertise provided by the Crown. This was also an important period in the development of artillery fortifications in England, most notably with the widespread adoption of specialist fortifications called bulwarks. Fortifications of this type had been used on the continent since the first decade of the 15th century. And indeed the English had constructed them in Normandy and in the Pale of Calais. Yet they were not used in England on a systematic basis until the 1450s when they were faced with the prospect of an invasion. These structures were essentially small forts with low thick walls and were heavily equipped with guns. They were often made of earth and timber, but were sometimes built with masonry or brick. Bulwarks were constructed at a number of towns, including Sandwich, Southampton, and Great Yarmouth. 
The last quarter of the 15th century was a period of comparatively rapid technological change, as can be seen by comparing the ordnance used to equip expeditionary armies from 1475 to 1497. The army sent by Edward IV to France in 1475 and Scotland in 1481 to 2 were equipped with iron guns called bombards, fowlers, pot guns and serpentines, which primarily fired gunstones. By comparison, the army sent by Henry VII to France in 1492 and Scotland in 1497 were armed with new types of guns called bombardels, great curtos, demi curtos and falcons. These new types of guns were mostly made of bronze and fired cast iron projectiles. Technological advances in France were responsible for these changes, such as the invention of blast furnace, which meant that iron could be decarbonized to produce cast iron. Henry VII was keen to utilize the latest technology from the continent. Therefore, gunners and other exp experts were recruited from France, Italy, and the Low Countries to work on the Royal Ordnance, where Bretons recorded as being employed in the Tower of London in the 1480s and 1490s. Early forms of handguns are recorded in very small numbers in the late 14th century. Yet it was not until the end of the 15th century that they were used on a regular basis in England. These weapons took two main forms. The first were known as handguns, as you can see on the left, which were essentially a prototype of the musket and could be easily moved and fired by soldiers. The type more commonly used by the English, however, uh, was heavier with hooks and was often mounted in stands as can be seen from the image on the right, and fired heavier bullets. From the 1470s onwards, these were used in sizable numbers. For example, in 1481, 150 handguns and 100 hackbutts were supplied for the expedition to Scotland. Four years later, the arsenal of the Pale of Calais consisted of as many as 529 handguns and hackbutts. Nevertheless, the prominent role of the longbow in English warfare but these weapons were only used in relatively small numbers, so in the low hundreds rather than thousands, and occupied a niche role in siege and naval warfare. By contrast, other continental powers at this time, such as the French and Burgundians, employed very large numbers of handguns in their armies. Towns continued to invest in their, invest in their artillery fortifications at the end of the 15th century as can be seen with Dartmouth Castle in Devon. In 1481, the corporation at Dartmouth was granted an annuity of 20 pounds, later increased to 40 pounds by Edward IV, as they had begun to make a strong tower and bulwark of stone and lime, which was to be furnished with guns and artillery, with a chain to be stretched across the river Dart to another tower on the other side of the river, which could be raised to stop the passage of hostile ships. These defensive works were added on to the side of an earlier castle, which itself dated from the late 14th century for the safeguard of the town and port. We can trace the development of this structure over time due to the survival of some of the accounts submitted to the Exchequer. So for example, between 1487 and 1492, the town's payments included the purchase of 22 guns for the defense of the castle, the construction of a bulwark at Kingswear on the other side of the river, and the wages of four watchmen. This period also saw a tremendous change in the armament of ships. This can be seen by comparing two ships, the Grasjur and the Regent. Henry V's great ship, the Grasjur, of 1400 tons, completed in 1420, was the largest royal vessel constructed before the 17th century, yet it only possessed three guns. In 1497, by contrast, Henry VII's slightly smaller ship, the region of 1,000 tonnes, was equipped with a total of 225 guns for an expedition to Scotland. This change was prompted by the innovation of the Miche, which was a swivel mount for guns and which allowed serpentines to be deployed effectively throughout ships, particularly in the castles. These weapons were not capable of sinking enemy vessels, but they did significantly increase the firepower of these ships. Okay, so I'm now going to go on to talk a bit about the guns themselves, starting with how they were constructed. The first method, as you can see on the left, 
involved the forging of iron guns by smiths and gunners who made use of wrought iron. This is an alloy that is known for its ductile and manable properties, which means that it can be welded when heated to a sufficient temperature. Iron bands and saves were welded together, uh, utilizing a similar technique to the way that barrels are constructed. The other method was to cast bronze guns using a, cap a copper alloy in a similar fashion to bell founding. So a copper alloy would be heated to a high temperature and then cast into a mold. In the early 15th century, the third method of transporting guns was to use teams of oxen and horses to move large carts filled with ordnance. The guns would then be unloaded and placed on wooden beds or stocks when they had reached their destination. From the mid 15th century onwards, however, guns were often given their own individual carriages, which were moved by teams of horses. This meant that guns were much more mobile and could be deployed in a more effective fashion on the battlefield. There are three main types of ammunition used in this period. Gunstones were the most common used type of projectile, which were carved by masons into round shapes. Lead shot was often used for handguns or small guns, which involved heating lead in pans until it turned into a liquid state, which was then poured into molds of bronze or stone to cast bullets. The earliest evidence we have for the manufacture of cast iron ammunition in England is for 1490, when it was manufactured in East Sussex in Ashdown Forest, a region later famous for gun founding. But it was rapidly adopted and used in large quantities from this date onwards. Gunpowder, uh, now generally referred to as black powder, is created from mixing three components together, saltpeter, otherwise known as potassium nitrate, sulfur and charcoal. The latter could be easily procured from England with willow and lime trees often being used, but the other two substances had to be imported from abroad. Sulfur could be obtained from Southern Italy, but saltpeter, the most important ingredient, was mainly supplied from India via the Mediterranean. The construction, maintenance, and deployment of gunpowder weapons and their accessories involved many different types of workers, the most important of which were the gunners. These images from a 15th century German manual show two of the jobs carried out by gunners in this period, supervising the deployment of guns and making gunpowder, but their role was not limited to these tasks alone. Unlike modern gunners, these were skilled craftsmen who, um, as opposed to soldiers, who had many different skills. Uh, these included the construction and repair of wrought iron guns, the casting of lead bullets, and the making of wooden carriages for the artillery. From the first decade of the 15th century onwards, gunners, alongside other workers, such as masons, carpenters, and laborers, were employed as part of ordnance companies. These men were used as support personnel for artillery on campaigns. The size of these companies uh, grew enormously in the final decades of the 15th century, with as many as 236 men receiving wages for the Blackheath campaign of 1497. Guns were placed or mounted on bases, such as wooden trestles, stocks, or wheeled carriages by laborers or other workers. Different loading procedures were used depending on whether guns were breech or muzzle, muzzle loading. Uh, breech loaders had separate powder chambers called gun chambers, which were filled with gunpowder, uh, then inserted into the back of the barrel and sealed into plates with a wooden wedge known as a forelock. Projectiles were either loaded from the front of the barrel or from the rear before the powder chain was added. Charging ladles made of iron were used to measure and insert gunpowder into the front of um, muzzle loaders which were then pushed to the back of the barrel by staves, with the shot also loaded from the front. Wooden wads known as tampons were employed to separate the gunpowder from the projectile for both types of guns to prevent the ammunition being damaged during firing. The gun was then secured into place by means of wooden blocks before an iron rod was inserted into the touch hole to ignite the gunpowder. Breach loaders appear to have a faster rate of fire than muzzle loaders, as their powder chambers could be quickly removed by use of a hammer and then replaced by a new chamber after the barrel was cleaned. 
Medieval guns have a modern reputation for being dangerous to their users and being unreliable in general. This is in part due to famous examples of accidents taking place, most notably the fatal injury caused to James II of Scotland at the siege of Roxburgh Castle in 1460. However, gun makers were aware of the potential for mishaps and did what they could to ensure the reliability of these weapons. Guns were test fired or proved to ensure that they were safe to use with Marl End, just outside of London, frequently used for testing royal guns in England. Occasionally, these weapons blew up under strain of firing, such as occurred to a large bronze gun fired in the presence of Edward IV in 1482. However, if anything, this demonstrates the prudence of testing guns prior to taking them with you on campaign. And research on surviving museum pieces from the period also revealed that wrought iron barrels and gun chambers were at least sometimes reinforced after construction. Evidence that we have from military campaigns shows that guns could be kept in operation for sustained periods of time. This can be seen from the accounts of John Hampton, master of the Ordnance for Henry VI, for the so-called Coronation Expedition to Northern France. His accounts list some 60 guns that were used during the campaigns of 1432, of which about a third were no longer usable by the end, but the others, despite having seen heavy action in the interim, remained serviceable. Financial records also reveal that repairs were frequently carried out to wrought iron guns. Uh, the casting process meant the bronze guns had to be melted down, um, recast when they got damaged. And this shows that even when things did go wrong, the damage caused was rarely too severe to prevent them being fixed. So I'm now going to finish my talk by briefly discussing which factors I believe were responsible for driving technological changes over this period. And in my opinion, there are two main factors. The first was royal interest in promoting the technology. Most kings in this period were enthusiastic about guns, which were often named after them, and they were frequently present when new guns were being test fired. Even the unwarlike Henry VI is recorded as being present at the test firing of experimental ammunition by Dutch gunners at Oxford in 1438. At times, this even extended to active royal involvement in the construction of these weapons, with Henry IV being recorded in the issue royal in 1408 as being personally responsible for designing a new large gun. It was for this reason that kings such as Henry V and Henry VII spent sizable sums of money on recruiting gunners and other experts from the continent. And this links into the second main factor, the import of foreign expertise and techniques into England. Most, if not all, technological innovations came from the continent, particularly from the Low Countries and France. This did not mean, however, that England was technologically inferior to its continental rivals. Uh, German gunners, for example, were in high demand across Europe and were employed by the kings of France and the Spanish kingdoms, as well as the Italian city-states. In fact, for much of the period, uh, the kings of England were utilizing the latest weapons from the continent. Thank you for listening. No, thank you, Dan. A, a fascinating talk, and I, uh, I, I always, I'm always in in awe of uh, medieval historians and how you manage reading medieval handwriting, <laughs> not just not just in Latin, but but sort of incomprehensible uh, of itself. So, some really interesting questions coming in. Uh, a nice one from uh, from William, just in terms of the logistics of ammunition. So, when we're looking at this, how many workers do you need to to put together, say? you know, the average siege train's worth of ammunition and are armies capable of creating this sort of material on the go or is it constrained by how much it can carry? Okay, so in terms of the ammunition, uh, for instance, gunstones, which is the main projectile, they tended to be made um, prior to the start mm -hmm. of the campaign by masons um, to standardise yeah. the portion. So they tended to be, um, mm -hmm. let's say, for instance, designed for... Um, um, barrels which are 12 inches in diameter, for instance. Um, so they tended to basically just buy them in from masons who would sell them to them. Um, in terms of logistics for getting the gun stones on the site, um, for example, if it was campaigns to France and typically they would ship them over 
and there are some interesting um, records to um, actually gunstones being moved by ship in Normandy during Henry V's conquest of Normandy um, due to the, you know, the state of the roads and the fact that it was more expensive to move things yeah. over land they tended to utilize those methods when they could. Mm-hmm. Yeah and in terms of uh, lead shot is there do we have any evidence as to to how they got out would that be you know is that provided as shot or is it easier to take lead pigs out and melt them down on campaign? Yeah, I think again, they tended to typically have, you know, they, they procured all this stuff in advance. So, for mm-hmm. instance, for Henry VII's uh, expedition to Scotland in 1497, we actually have the records of all the equipment that was shipped over um, for the campaign. And there was there was huge numbers of uh, guns, uh, forms of ammunition, mm-hmm. accessories. I suspect during a siege context, um, it probably was possible to say cast some lead yeah. bullets, particularly as you're starting to get through with them. Uh, but generally speaking, you want to have this stuff in advance so you can use it. Yes. Yeah. And when you're moving, you're moving. You don't want to be sort of camping in one place because obviously it's, uh, yeah, you're in enemy territory. Actually, while we're on the topic of, of the sort of logistics side of thing, I had a question from Mark, not from me, but another Mark. <laughs> uh, so again, at this stage, what's the process for uh gunpowder composition putting it together and how long does it take to get a really reliable re- uh, recipe for it that's a good question um you mean in terms of when they started becoming reliable or in terms of how long it took let's say a gunner to mix mix i don't know uh, you know effectively make gunpowder effectively I, I, I don't imagine the the time elapsed changes much up to the 19th century other than the mechanization but the actual yeah. the process of getting something that will you know is, is usable in the field that doesn't sort of disperse into its various components that, that's quite interesting yes i mean i don't know about the exact time frame because one of the issues here is that um mm-hmm. the nature of the sources which i've not really mentioned yeah. is they tend to most of the sources i've used have been financial mm-hmm. so they tend to effectively record um, effect of their auditing, so they're accounting for items of expenditure. Uh, so they tend to list, you know, frequently gunpowder, salt, peter, or not comes up. They don't tend to say how long it takes a gunner to do it. Um, although typically they are t- paid in terms of um, piece rates, so a day, a day's wages for making <laughs> certain proportions of gunpowders. Um, in terms of proportions, uh, what is interesting is in the really, I suppose, towards the last decade of the 15th century. So you actually get specialised uh, compositions of gunpowder for different types of guns. Um, so particularly for, let's say, handguns or for touch powder, you tended to have much higher proportions of saltpetre, I'm guessing because you wanted to burn much more quickly. Yeah. Uh, whereas for bombards, for instance, you tend to have a lower proportion of um, saltpetre, I guess, for the opposite reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to, to avoid catastrophe. <laughs> that, that sort of leads us on to another interesting point, really, because presumably how, how at this stage is, is knowledge passed on? So are there specific training schools which people will learn this in, or is it purely like an apprentice master thing where people learn it by osmosis? The latter. Uh, mm-hmm. It's really interesting. In terms of England, you don't really get things organised on the base until well into the 16th century, in fact. Um, again, it's not very well documented, but it seems that effectively people were passing on skills, I suppose, through apprentices, effectively. Um, and it's interesting because, I mean, gunners, as I said in the talk, they had quite a range of different skills, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was specialist knowledge, and they were quite highly regarded. So some of them were quite actually well-paid uh, individuals. Um, I suspect that's part of the reason why they were quite keen to get foreign expertise in. Possibly because in some of the continental um, areas, they did perhaps have it on a more organised basis. Um, And, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, it didn't get, you know, organised into schools until much later on. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's... I'm not really sure what the reason for that is, to be honest. (laughs) I mean, is it is it perhaps something to do with the low social status of, of gunners? Because we've we've had a mention of the the rumor that medieval gunners were excommunicated because of the association with sulfur and the devil. Is it what what sort of status do gunners have at this point? 
Well, they are effectively the same status as craftsmen. So mm -hmm. um, one way you can tell um, the status of people in, say, armies, mm -hmm. campaigns, is actually how much they're being paid. Because people tend to get paid in terms of their social status as opposed to necessarily the job they did. So um, a normal gunner was typically paid sixpence a day old money, uh, which was the equivalent of the mounted archer. Whereas um, master gunners tend to be paid at the rate of a shilling a day or 12 mm -hmm. pence, which is about the rate of a, a man at arms. So, you know, heavily armored, um, effectively aristocratic warrior. Um, in terms of the point about their status, you don't, not that I've come across any real sort of um, sense that they are, um, those thought as being, you know, kind of, I don't know, what's the word, you know, malevolent figures <laughs> in this particular period. No, I mean, it's much later that you, in the 16th century, you kind of get this mm -hmm. sense of gunpowder being a negative force for change. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the gunners, one thing I didn't mention was that um, some of the towns employed gunners. Mm -hmm. So for Southampton, which we have some wonderful financial records for, they had a town gunner from quite an early period. Mm -hmm. um, but initially... Um, even though they had a town gunner who was an official who received a livery, so clothing from the corporation, uh, initially they were only employing him on a sort of temporary sort of contract basis. Mm -hmm. And he occasionally had to sort of um, eke out his um, uh, wages through doing sort of labouring jobs and you know, odd jobs here and yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> so I think um, they were valued people, but I do wonder what they were doing when you know, they, weren't, they weren't in need. People didn't need to employ them. Yeah, I think that also answers uh, Jonathan Ferguson's question about evidence towards early negative attitudes towards guns. Actually, it's later when they're more efficient than these start coming through. Yeah, I think it's also when it, they start affecting the social order more. Mm -hmm. So at this point, when, um, let's say, the bombards replacing trebuchets mm -hmm. or, um, I don't know, the smaller guns replacing, let's say, um, you know, defensive artillery for castles, mm -hmm. then, you know, they're effectively fin replacing weapons that are already in use. Mm -hmm. um, so as I say, it's not until the 16th century and handguns yeah. really start to you know, you know, make it so you can kill armoured knights quite easily that it becomes a problem yeah good another question from, from uh, Mark Brown on this point actually uh, so the ordnance companies are they paid as a group or are there differential pay rates you know, depending on, on status experience anything like that yeah so I mean each peer person wait, received as a wage based effectively on their status. Um, so effectively it tends to be, it varies. I mean, so effectively masons, carpenters and gunners tend to be paid at the same types of rates. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned before, master gunners often receive 12 pence, um, standard gunners, let's say six pence, but then again, they might even subdivide them. So a level in between people receiving eight pence a day. Mm -hmm. um, so they're affecting on the same level as craftsman in this period yeah and i mean obviously you know pay is is one of the rewards the other obviously being fame are there gunners who are you know noted in chronicles famous individuals anything like that or, or do they tend to to be glossed over in favor of the more you know the aristocratic uh, warriors effect in effect Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, I'm not sure about continental sources. I'm sure there are some. I can't think of any of that. You know, gunners mm -hmm. are mentioned by name. In terms of the English sources, you don't, even when you have accounts of sieges, for instance, I mentioned uh, the guest of Henry C. Quinty, mm -hmm. there are no mention of the individuals precisely because these are craftsmen rather than, let's say, um, you know, aristocratic leaders. Mm -hmm. so they really are quite obscure individuals, actually. I mean, I managed to trace the careers of some people just because they sharp in pay records. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found somebody called Godfrey Goykin, who was involved in the, um, um, the Hafler campaign in 1415 and was still active up until the 1430s. Mm -hmm. um, but no, they really were, I suppose like many other kind of soldiers and you know, craftspeople at the time, they, weren't, they didn't really feature much, much in the records as individuals. Yeah, I was going to say presumably there's a, there's an element of just things aren't particularly well recorded necessarily in the in the medieval period on that personal uh, the personal level. Speaking of uh, kind of documentation stuff, uh, for the for the manuscript sources you've got, how close are they to the the events that they're describing? 
Yeah, um, I'm thinking illuminated manuscripts here, sorry, rather than the uh, the financial records or the like. Yeah, um, in terms of the illuminated manuscripts, those are interesting because um, I've used some examples from the British Library mm-hmm. and also from Swiss Chronicles. Mm-hmm. Now, typically, they depict events from different historical periods. What you're interested in really is when the date they were actually created. So they might be mm-hmm. depicting scenes from, I don't know, ancient Rome, mm-hmm. um, but you would have completely acronistic, let's say, gunpowder weapons being used, you know, the siege of Troy or whatnot. Um, they do seem to be quite accurate in terms of, you know, approximately from their periods they're actually showing. I mean, that's partly why I showed some for the showing the mantlets and things, because it's something we can corroborate with other sources. Mm-hmm. Um, again, with Chronicles, um, mm-hmm. The Gesser, that's very, that's very close to the events it's depicting. I think it's actually dates, it was created, I think, the year after the campaign. Uh, for some of them, you do get them, you know, they might be talking about events 30, 50 years before, in which case you need to you know, be a bit more careful with them. Uh, again, well, financial records tend to be reasonably reliable in that they turn, tend to be created quite mm-hmm. soon, you know, within a year, effectively, of what they're recording, effectively. Yeah. Another question that uh, sort of uh, arises from that is, is to this kind of standardization. Uh, you know, some guns are known by name, others are uh, by broad types, but is there a sort of European standard for what, say, a serpentine is? How, you know, is how, how sort of standardized are, for instance, you know, calibers, the size of ammunition, all that sort of stuff? You do get a sense, it does, you gradually get a sense of standardization over time. So it certainly doesn't exist early on. Um, I don't think there was a European wide um, you know, standard for certain mm-hmm. types of guns. And certainly when you get into other countries like, um, let's say, the German lands, they have quite different words they use even for the same gun. So it's quite difficult to work that out. Um, in terms of, by the late 15th century, certainly, you have attempts to standardize guns. Mm-hmm. So um, what is quite interesting is that those accounts I mentioned before for the 1497 expedition to Scotland mm-hmm. is um, they were even recording um, certain types of guns with certain proportions of um, ammunition of certain sizes and weights, proportions of gunpowder used to fire shots. Um, I'm not sure how far that's reflected in the actual, you know, mm-hmm on the ground as it were it could be the records are showing a react you know a, a sort of um an ideals you know a sort of um mm-hmm. ideal version that doesn't actually exist in practice but certainly it does seem like by the time you get to that point there are so many different types of guns they're almost kind of um feeling certain niches as it were yes uh So in, in, in terms of use on the battlefield, we had a quick question from David Knight, which is, uh, are, is, is artillery of the period capable of being repositioned or is it entirely static? I think, generally speaking, I think it would be static. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of the Wars of the Roses, in some of the battles there, for instance, Battle of Northampton, they literally adopted a, a, a sort of field fortifications. Um, so the Lancastrians had a effectively a fortified camp. Um, it didn't work out very well for them, uh, <laughs> but that's what they tried. Um, in terms of some of the other battles at the Wars of the Roses, such as Tewkesbury and Barnet, um, it seems that there were artillery duels. Um, and it seems from the sources that they were kind of deployed in front of, in front of the formations or to the side of them. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence they tried to move them. Um, I suppose it would be very early if they were trying to. This is sort of long before you idea you get to you know, sort of field artillery being moved by horses um, mid battle. And certainly their effectiveness has varied quite a lot. So sometimes they seem to have had some impact, other times not at all, or even detrimental perhaps. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And thank you for the, the observation about the Battle of Barnet as well. We had a question from Jeanette about uh, the ordnance, you know, something about the ordnance used there. But I think that, that sort of hopefully covers it quite effectively. One thing to, to bear in mind, just for the, the people as well, is that, uh, you know, as late as the, the 19th century, the volunteer artillery, people are worried about their ability to move guns under fire. You know, a lot of the time they're using oxen or draft horses who aren't particularly keen on being under fire. So there's, a you know, 
we, we think of horse artillery, we think of it moving around the field, but actually it's, it's quite late in the period that that, that comes around. So just in context. Uh, question on, on, on construction. So in terms of effectiveness, uh, you know, is uh, iron versus bronze? Are uh, iron what, what advantages does iron have against bronze and vice versa? I think the major advantage for iron is it's cheaper, mm -hmm. um, and also in terms of I think the skills. So, um, so you often have gunners who have um, smithery skills effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's probably so. It's on the one hand, it's probably cheaper and also easier to repair as well. So if a gun chamber gets damaged, you can effectively patched it up i suppose um the advantage of bronze is that i think because it's cast it's effectively more stable so it's less likely to shatter when they say you're test firing or using it in battle um conversely though more expensive mm -hmm. um it's interesting in the late 15th century with when they have they're starting to use these sort of new types of french guns it seems there was actually a fall in the price of um effectively bronze mm -hmm. um so I'm not sure what's happening there. Perhaps like new sort sort of techniques they were using, or something. But um, it's interesting. I I looked quite a lot at the records of the Pale of Calais, which is mm -hmm. a um, in this period is a heavily fortified English enclave in northern France. Um, and they I've actually managed to trace a number of guns used by the garrison over a hundred and ten year period. And what's interesting there is initially there's quite a high proportion of bronze guns. And then in the early 15th century, they switched to iron primarily. And I think that's simply because it's cheaper and you can get more of these types of weapons. Yeah. How much overlap is there between uh, casting bells and casting cannon? Or do, do we have any evidence to that? Oh, yeah. I mean, the people finding bells are also often the same people, mm -hmm. um, you know, making guns effectively. Yeah. Um, yeah. So effectively, they... They don't go. They don't necessarily have um, specialist gun founders, mm -hmm. particularly early on in the period. They tend to be people who um, will do that as well. And I think that's one of the reasons why, even though to us guns coming in seems quite a remarkable development, perhaps at the time it was it was less remarked upon simply because people could use existing skills they have, mm -hmm. um, let's say in terms of smithery or casting mm -hmm. bells. Mm -hmm. um, so they were quite adaptable, really, in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I've got a couple of questions on the Battle of Bosworth, which I might sort of group together if, if that's all right. So one from Neil Carey, which is a, a sort of general one about how our understanding of the guns of the period has changed by the discoveries of ammunition at, at, at you know, by the Battle of Bosworth. Yes, I mean, <laughs> they've definitely been very useful because there's very little historical evidence for the use mm -hmm. of guns at Bosworth. So in fact, if it wasn't for the, you know, the, these remarkable um, finds there would even be a case of saying were they even used as based purely on the historical evidence um i suppose the main thing is to show just how um widespread they were in the battlefield um i've not actually you know it's I'm, i look at these things from a primary historical view as opposed to an mm -hmm. archaeologist but mm -hmm. um there is some possible evidence suggests that also that maybe the size of uh, lead shots was increasing as well um, just based on the fact that there are some quite large lead bullets effectively who've been found on the battlefield there. Yeah. Yes, and that, that may in fact answer a question from Paul, which is that cube-shaped shot is, has been discovered at Bosworth suggesting the use of grape shot, which, you know, the grape shot canister, that sort of stuff. Now, is there an anti-personnel role for artillery in this period? Uh, yes, I mean, and there's also records for things like um, hell shot, effectively, mm -hmm. in, in the 1480s, uh, which I guess probably approximates to that. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, often serpentines, which seem to be used in anti-personnel, or I'll use the you know, lead mm -hmm. shot, effectively. But you also seem to have some evidence of um, gunstones being used in that capacity as well. And I expect it's because this is fairly early days in the use of, you know, guns on the battlefield. So they're trying out different sort of projectiles doing horrible things to people, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, just looking over some questions from uh, from YouTube. Interesting one from, from Stephen, actually. In respect of, you know, town gunners, what other roles do they perform? Might they be more like a modern town commissioner and have an administrative role? Or is it, are they purely specialising in artillery? I mean, do we even have any evidence for, for what exactly their job is? 
Yeah, I mean, in the 16th century, you do have actually some um, evidence for, you know, actually specifying exactly this is what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. So Southampton has some record of that, that, um, you know, if you're employed by the town, we expect you <laughs> to be around and to look after the town's guns and um, maintain them. Um, it's interesting. Um there is some evidence also for people who aren't necessarily town gunners, but they seem to have similar roles. So keepers of artillery. So you get those in places like York and Sandwich, in which they do perhaps perhaps have more a kind of um, administrative or maintenance role for just looking after the guns in general, rather than being people who are um, repairing them. Um, but generally speaking, gunners, except for the example I mentioned for Southampton, where um, I think it's Harry Gunner, I think his name mm-hmm was occasionally doing odd jobs to supplement his income. Generally speaking, they seem to be employed for items relating to guns. So mm-hmm. making gunpowder, uh, repairing uh, the carriages of guns and whatnot. Okay. And a couple of questions just on, uh, I, guess, I guess, on the, the practical side of thing. So, I mean, the, the, the question is, uh, have modern reproductions on testing shown as what kind of ranges and velocities the guns are aim, uh, capable of? But of course, then you've got the question of, despite what they're capable of, what can they actually hit? Yes, I mean, I haven't looked a great deal at this, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. And um, one of the frustrating things about the sources is, again, before the late 16th century, surprisingly, is very little reference actually what the ranges of these weapons would be. Mm-hmm. Um, it's only really the late 16th century when you start getting these sort of manuals, treaties coming in that you get some sense of that. And by that period, it seems that they sort of were varying in maximum range between perhaps, um, they say a thousand paces to 3000, depending on the very mm-hmm. biggest ones. Um, there is some mention actually from um, some French sources in the late 15th century, which show, I think one of them referred to um, basically saying that gun batteries, if you're besieging, say, a town or castle, should be placed about 30 or 40 paces away from a moat or ditch of the, um, the fortification you're dealing with, um, which seems quite close, to be honest. Um, I suppose, yeah, you said the difficulty is knowing, you know, the range you know, and accuracy of them. And also, I suppose, in terms of the powder used at the time, as opposed to, I don't know, powder we might use now mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. It- in terms of the treaties that you were you were talking about, would they include stuff like you know standardised range tables of you know if you're propelling this ball with this amount of powder, this is normally how far you can expect, or is it so specific to a particular gun that it's not worth including that sort of information? No, by the late 16th century, they certainly had tables of gun types, and mm-hmm. I think if anything, I mean this is much foreshadowed even in the period I'm looking at, in that um, you don't get ranges per se, but you do get um, um, let's say particular size of shot or proportions of gunpowder used for shot, even in the late 15th century. Um, I suspect the gunners probably had a sense and you know, practical knowledge of what they were doing and the effective ranges. It just, it's never been committed to paper just because either in the financial records, the clerks recording you know, what the crown has spent money on aren't interested or it's chroniclers who again aren't interested in, you know, they either don't, aren't interested in these sort of um, lower class people or um, they don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it's hard to get your head around an era where, you know, paper is so precious and, and knowledge is passed on personally because we have, you know, we generate so much data and we store so much stuff. That it, 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 you know, a, a, an oral culture is something difficult to, to get your head around. I had two last quick questions, I, I suppose. Uh, one, one interesting one from Chris I liked. You know, we, we talked about gunners being specialists. Were they treated better in the event of capture? And also one thing I'd like to add is how common is it for gunners to be recruited from one side to the other as, as prisoners or, you know, just, just change sides in the middle of a war? I don't actually really know. I think because, <laughs> again, we don't really know much. I don't know. I think it's because they are lower class people. They tend to shut. They don't tend to get ransomed, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess because many of them are, you know, they might be Dutch or later on Breton or um, Italian or whatnot. I suspect in practice, many of them probably did just, you know, change employer effectively. Um, I can't imagine that many, let's say Dutch gunners were particularly, 
you know, um, aligned to English service necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's one of those, I think, I suspect it probably did happen, but we don't really have any evidence for it, certainly not in this period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. So uh, uh, one last question. Uh, uh, we have, uh, well, unfortunately, we've had far more questions than we, we have been able to ask. However, Dan is on Twitter and Instagram, at Gunpowder Dan. So if, if you have any questions that we don't manage to get around, he will be more than happy to answer them. But just one last sort of overall one. The argument in this period is that the introduction of artillery brings more power to the royalty at, at, the, sort of the, at the expense of the aristocracy because all this stuff is, is very expensive. In your ex- experience, is that borne out by the evidence or is, is this uh, you know, a, a historical generalisation? I think long term, in terms of structural changes, yes. Um, I suppose each country is rather different in that mm-hmm. England's a very centralised state. So I think that the nobility have less of a, let's say, uh, a territorial power base by the time we get to the late Middle Ages. Um, so it's not, for example, the case where in France, for instance, where you have all these sort of civil wars and regional players who can threaten the crown quite easily. Um, um, I mean, the interesting thing is, I mean, the, you can take it, I suppose, too far in certain sense in that the crown was quite happy for people to use guns. So you didn't have any form of gun control in this period, really. Um, it's sometimes been argued that, you know, the crown wanted to centralise con- control and, you know, you know restrict its um, possession by other people. But no, the opposite, in fact, the kings were very happy for towns and nobles to acquire guns, um, effectively because this is a period long before we have a standing army. Mm-hmm. Um, and you tend to have few garrisons around and only when they really need it. Mm. Um, so even though it does lead to these sort of long-term trends, I think particularly later on when you get, let's say, um, a, a permanent navy um, and gun production methods become more com- complex, um, so it does become more centralised. But on the other hand, um, there's no monopoly on mm. these type of weapons at all. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, an absolutely fascinating talk, covered a lot of ground, and you know, unfortunately, we couldn't get through everyone's questions. But as I mentioned, you are on Twitter and Instagram, and you're more than happy to to respond to anything that people might have, presumably. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and uh, just to let everyone know as well, uh, Dan's book is out at the minute. I will pop a link in the uh, Zoom chat. Just let me know. There. So. The- there is a yes, there is a, and also hopefully on YouTube chat uh, to Dan's book, which is out at the minute based on his doctoral thesis. Uh, absolutely fascinating, you know, covers some of what's in here, but a lot of other information as well. But thank you very much for joining us today, Dan. It's been absolutely fascinating. Great. Thank you very much. No problem. And yes, and, and thank you. Unfortunately, that is all, all the time we have for today. But thank you as well to Adam for producing the event behind the screens and, uh, and obviously to. Uh, to the audience for taking the time out of your day to be with us and for the questions you had to the speaker. As I said, if there's anything else you have to ask, feel free to, to get in touch with Dan. Alternatively, if it's something about our collections or about artillery in general, inquiries at armories.org.uk will get you in touch with one of our curators. Now, those of you interested in medieval and early modern warfare elsewhere in the world may also be interested in an online course that we are running in partnership with the Aga Khan University which covers warfare in the medieval Islamic world. I will drop a link in the chat there. Uh, there is a discount on that for Royal Armouries members. It's run by Professor Stefan Pradin of the Aga Khan University. It's looking at the interconnection between war and culture in the Islamic Middle East and Egypt. Uh, yes, links are in the chat. Please do check it out if you're interested. Uh, our next event on the 11th of November, we'll look at something slightly more modern. Uh, Andre Horn, the t- uh, team leader for Eurofins Forensics, will explore the work of the modern forensics firearms scientist. Uh, for more details, please go to our website, which is royalarmies.org. Uh, I look forward to seeing you there in two weeks' time. Thank you very much, and good afternoon.